thank you. So, okay, so let's we'll start. So, uh, welcome Kisun Lee from Georgia Tech. So, he'll speak on certified solutions to a square analytic system. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. And Is the um, video on? Yeah, he said that you are already recorded. So, uh, I'm really happy to give a talk in here. So, today I want to talk about certifying solutions to a square analytic system. So, in terms of research, I'm interested in certifying the output of the numeric algorithms. So in this talk, scope of today's talk is about certifying the numerical roots of the scale of the analytic system. So for example, let's say that you have some system equations, and you're going to solve that using some numerical solver. Then you're going to get a numerical root, probably that is really close to your exact root, but of course we don't know where the exact root is. But and, and actually that is not, that numerical root cannot be your exact root. So we want to check that whether this given approximation is good or not. So before I start our talk, this talk consists of two parts, so which is the work that I've done recently, so I think I need to introduce my co-authors first. So first half of the talk is about certifying the regular root, which means that we deal with the uh, um, root with the multiplicity one, simple root. So it was done with uh, Michael Burr, who's a faculty in Clemson. Yeah, so the screen does not work with the. Uh, he was a student here in Quran. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so he he was also a student in NYU. So I mean, a faculty in Clemson University, and Anton Lincoln, who's my other advisor in Georgia Tech. So second half of the lecture, uh, second half of the talk is about multiple roots. So we think about the multiple roots in here. It was work done with Dan Li and Li Hongzi. They are both in China. Okay. So before uh, I introduce the main part, I think I need to remind you what is the meaning of the certifying the solutions. So let's say that you have some solution. Uh, you have you have some system equations, and we solve that using some numerical solver. Then we're gonna have this kind of point x in here which is just the numerical root of the solution, is obtained from the numerical solver. Of course, we don't know where the exact root is. But from this numerical root x, we are going to obtain some re compact region, which is called capital I in here. This is the region, compact region, which is obtained from the, this x in here. And we are going to apply some algorithm to check that this x star, which is the exact root of the original solution, is contained inside the capital I in here. And also, not only this one, we also say that we want to say that other roots of the system is not contained inside this, this region, which means that we want to prove the uniqueness of the root also. So let me talk a little bit more rigorously that let's say that we have some compact region, which is probably obtained from the numerical root. Then we are going to apply some algorithm, and we want to check the existence and uniqueness of the root inside our capital region I. This is the meaning of the certifying the roots. So when we deal with the multiple roots, this same concept will be also applied. Okay. So I mentioned about the analytic system in here. So in the first half of the talk, we will focus on some special kinds of the analytic system. So as an example, let me just give you error function in here. So this is an analytic function. So this is a second sentence is not designed to be read. But I just want to say that this error function satisfies some differential equation with the skip and initial value conditions. So with this error function, we're going to consider some square analytic system. So in this system, we have two variables and two equations. So this is a square system. But I want to, so this is the analytic system, but I want to write down this kind of analytic system in a little bit more general way. And also, we want to give arithmetic operations onto the functions that we use in the system in a way that we can be allowed to compose our function or add function or multiply function. So in other words, I will just write down this capital F in here. So now we have four variables and four equations in here. We have two equations which are polynomial. But can you read this? Can you? Yeah. So uh, third equation is corresponding to the first error function in here. The uh, fourth equation corresponding to the second error function in here. So if you plug in, t3 and t4 inside your second equation, then exactly you're going to get this system. So we want to write down this kind of general form of the system equations. So analytic system in the first half of the talk is about this kind of system. Okay. So, uh, well, would you go back to the yeah. slide? So you said certified existence and uniqueness. Yeah, right. Is it the, uh, can you replace certified by proof? 
certify here as the mean of uh, as the mean of proof, right? Yeah, uh, I mean we can guarantee that there's a, in the inside the compact region there's a, only one but inside of the system. Can you fail? That's the question. Oh yeah, of course. Right. Can so we, how can you be sure that you will always or under what conditions you know you will succeed? Oh, so if if it, the, for example, like uh, in alpha theory, if you just compute the alpha value, which is big bigger than the some magic number, then we can say that, of course, that that root can be more refined. So, so there's a, some kind of a like a signature that we can check whether the certification works or not. So of course it can fail. Then in that case, we should have more higher precision to our numerical solver or something like that. Uh, what do you mean by failure? Failure means that gives no answer or gives no answer. Gives no answer. Gives no answer. Yeah. So it, of course it may be an approximate solution, but we don't know. It it means fail. Yeah. Failure of the certification. So. Uh, so basically, what I want to say is in this talk is so we want to certify given approximation x in here, which is a probably numerical root. And when we will kind of consider this capital F in here, we have n plus m variables and n plus m equations. First, n equations are polynomial with n plus m variables. And the last equations are, we have uh, ingredients in here. We have each g of, uh, gi function in here. So this g sub i is a univariate analytic function. So in the first half of, the, half of this talk, we're gonna call this as ingredients, okay? So, and, and for the further notation, we have x star, which is a notation for the actual root of the capital F. So with this notation, what we want to do is, when we have some compact region capital I, we want to check the existence and uniqueness of the x star inside our capital region I. This is what we want to do. So the regular root was to mean? A regular root means that uh, multiplicity is one. There's a simple root. Define that for an analytic system. Uh, what do you mean by how do we? What is the multiple? Could you explain what the multiplicity is? Uh, okay, so in in terms in in order to define like analytic uh, multiplicity in algebraic way, probably we can think about the Taylor expansion of the each system, each equation inside of the system. Then we're gonna have the same multiplicity structure. So multiplicity of that root can be also multiplicity of this kind of root, but it is just a usual sense of the multiplicity. Like uh, which is what? Uh, oh, can you say it? So what is the usual sense of multiplicity? Uh, multiplicity? Like. Okay, so probably the which is obtained from the Hilbert function. So. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Hilbert function. So, I mean, uh, what I can like say about like multiplicity in here is like, so maybe taking the Taylor series expansion would be the best answer that I can give. Like, if you think about the Taylor expansion, then what? analytic system become Taylor series expansion of what? Uh, of the analytic functions inside our system. Of the equations. Yeah, of the equations. Yes. Then it will gonna be the polynomial system. Then our system becomes a polynomial system because we I mean, just infinite, infinite oh system. of course we're gonna truncate that yeah, up to like a how, finite uh, we just co compute the finite many terms of the Taylor expansion. So if we have a like this kind of error function, then we just consider finite many terms of the Taylor expansion. How many? Uh, high enough. Uh, but it is actually it is actually known that how may, how high it should be, oh, but I but. See. But when it is high enough, then the multiple structure is the same with this analytic system locally. Then in that case, we can also define multiplicity in terms of the polynomial system. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, that's the best answer that I can. Yeah. Could you explain a little bit uh, how the how the equation can rewrite as f f t one up to t oh I see up to t four. So instead of writing down this error function in here, we just Take this as a t. One we just introduce more variables. This uh, analytic functions many. So we have two analytic functions in here. So we introduce two more variables. 
So T3 corresponding to the first order function with the first, equal, uh, first variable, and the T4 correspond to the second variable. Okay. So if you have M equations in here, M equations inside our system, then we introduce N more variable, and inside our polynom first polynomial system, we got N again, we get N plus N variables. So, Thank you. So let's look at some previous works about this one. So when we have an ingredient of polynomial, then our capital F is just a polynomial system. And the algorithm for this kind of certification was implemented by John Howenstein and Frank Sotley in 2012. When we have an exponential function, for example, like trigonometric function or hyperbolic function, then the algorithm for a certification was implemented by John Howenstein and Victor Lewandowski in 2017. They are both implemented in alpha certified. So they used alpha theory to certify that. Okay. And so it's so implemented in alpha certified. So what, what is alpha certified? Oh, this is the software. 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 So you can just type in, you can just input, plug in like a, a system and a approximate solution, then it will want to give you the answer. Yeah. Is it standalone? Is it yeah, it is standalone. So, uh, in this, in this work, we we're going to use two different methods to certify the solutions. The first one is a crouching method, and the second thing is the alpha theory. So the crouching method is some kind of interval extension of the Newton iteration. So it combines an interval arithmetic and the Newton method. So let me just introduce what is the interval arithmetic a little bit more briefly. So we want to, in order to have some conservative region when we, compute, uh, when we do the computation, we just give some arithmetic operations in between interval. So we can just add interval, multiply interval, subtract, and divide interval. Then, and the alpha theory is actually well-known Smales alpha theory. So it certifies the given approximation converges quadratically to the actual root or not. So let me just tell you about what is a quadratic convergence. So we first define this Newton operator. Then we can also apply this Newton operator multiple times. Then if kth iteration of this Newton operator satisfies this inequality, then we call that this given approximation x converges to x star quadratically. Okay? So in this case, in this case, we call this approximation x as approximate solution for x star. So let me just look at this crouching method a little bit more with detail. Let's say that we have a capital F, which is the square system, which is differentiable. This i is the this this is the region that we want to certify. So it will gonna be given as an interval because we want to do our interval arithmetic. Then with this i, we are gonna think about which is called interval extension, which is denoted as the square of this capital F of capital I. So this is just the collection of the values of the capital F over some interval. And uh, again, to certify an interval uh, means that uh, the system has a uh, has a unique solution. There. Yeah, in, inside this interval, exactly. inside this given interval, in, given input, okay? Yes, and so if we have a polynomial system, it is, it is quite easy to compute this kind of interval extension because we can just plug an interval inside our variable. But if you have analytic functions, probably slightly more complicated. So why is just any point inside our interval? Probably we can, inside our implementation, we just choose a middle point of the interval and what capital Y is the invertible matrix. And then we can, using this ingredients, then we can define a crouching method, something like this. This is an interval operator, so actually they're just an interval box. Then using this, uh, using this crouching operator, we, we have the theorem which is suggested by Krupp in 1969. So the first one is, let's say that X inside our capital I is actually the root of this capital F. In that case, X is also contained inside our crouching operator. This is the first one. But next thing is important. So if your crotch operator is contained inside the original input i, then we can say that there is a root of the capital F inside our original input i, So which proves the existence of the root. And also, the last one is, if we satisfy this additional norm condition, then it will going to make our crotch operators something like a construction map. So if you apply this corruption operator multiple times, it's going to be, so uh, uh, interval, interval is going to be smaller and smaller. So we can also prove the uniqueness using this one. 
And also, when we deal with the interval, it is quite natural to think over the real. So we can also switch this thing over the real. So when you just switch this to real, then we should have we should change our room condition in here. But everything just works the original, uh, just the same in the same way. And actually, this is the original version of the project theorem. Because yeah, it is quite natural to think about origin uh, interval over the real. Okay. So this is a Krochik theorem. So what's the difference in the real and the complex version? Oh, we only have a difference in the real. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, coefficient of the norm condition, it become because when we deal with the con uh, complex interval, we should have an imaginary interval part. So it gives us us at most square root of two part. Does it depend on n? It's not like. Square root oh, it does not depend n. on it because we are just dealing with like a oh infinity yeah. norm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this norm is actually the interval norm, which is defined as a maximum value, which is infinity norm. So uh, as a one more remark, if we have a capital F, which is hard to compute, uh, when, when the capital F of y is hard to compute, we can also think about this interval extension for this capital F of y. Then we can also define this new crotch operator. If you replace everything with this new crotch operator, then everything works nicely. Okay. So this is all about the crotch method. Let me also introduce about alpha theory. So let's say that we have a point x in here. Please remember that we have a coordinate x1 through xn. Then with this return iteration map, we can define these three parameters. So first one, alpha, is obtained by the multiplication of the beta and the gamma. Beta. It's just the length of the Newton step. And gamma is obtained by the supremum of, of inverse of Jacobian times k derivative and divided by k factorial and take the k minus, uh, k minus 1 through it, which is really complicated. But anyway, alpha theory says that when the value of alpha is less than this number, then x converges to x star quadratically. And also, also we have a region which contains x star. So distance between x and x star is less than or equal to two, two times beta, which means that we have some concrete region which contains x star uniquely. So we can also use this alpha theory to certify the root. But the problem is, of course, this gamma part, because we have a supremum for the infinitely many k values. And also, if you look inside, we have a k -th derivative, which is k-symmetric tensor, which is computationally really expensive. So usually, we find upper bound for this gamma value, and we use that upper bound instead of that. So natural question is, do we have such upper bound when we have an analytic system? And we now I suggest the theorem in here. So let's say that we have univariate analytic function, which is ingredient, which that I called ingredient before. Let's say that we have gi. gi corresponds to xi, which is the coordinate of x in here. So then we need two oracles which is the first one is a capital Ri. This is a positive value, which is slightly less than the radius convergence of GI. So GI is an analytic function. We can think about the series expansion. Then we can also get the radius convergence. The positive value, which is slightly less than that, will be called as Ri. And Mi, this is just upper bound of this absolute value of the analytic function over some disk. So when we have these two values, then we can also compute this upper bound for this gamma. This mu is a condition number for f and x. So we can also, uh, uh, yeah, so this is the upper bound for this gamma in here. So we can use alpha theory, actually, okay, without computing this gamma value. But let me just go back to our original two methods, because there is some problem. If you think, if you remember the Krochik method, Kroch operator, we need to find these two interval extensions. Also, if you see the alpha theory, we need to find out capital Mi and capital Ri. So capital Mi is just like I said before. This is the maximum value of the analytic function over some disk. And capital R is the radio, comes from the radius convergence. So the question is, how can we get these two oracles? So we need to answer these two following questions. First one is, how can we evaluate analytic functions over, over at a point or over an interval? And the second question is, how can we get the radius convergence? Okay. If we can answer this question, then we can also get this, get these values, get this red part in here. So we decided to look at some special case of a special family of the analytic function, which is called definite functions. So let me just introduce what is definite functions first. 
So define a function is a class of the analytic function, which is the solution of the linear differential equation with the polynomial coefficients. So if you have g of t, which is satisfied this differential equations with the given initial value condition, it will going to be called as a definite function. So this definite function is quite well studied area. So Van der Hoeven in 1999, he suggested a analytic continuation algorithm, which is used for, which is using for the approximate the value of the definite function. And also because this definite function is an analytic function, we can think about the series expansion. In this case, we, we, we call this as a major series. So Metzler and Salvi presented the algorithm for the major series for the definite function. So we can also extract the radius convergence from this major series. So they are both implemented in these two softwares. So in our experiments, we use the SAGE method implementation. Okay. Now it is time to do some experiments. Oh, oh, so the point is now we can certify the roots of the system when we have a defined functions as ingredients. So I will show you some experiments. The first one, so in order to show, in order to do with some examples, we just consider some optimization problem. So in order to make some optimization problem, we consider two different ellipses in here. So we, we because we have two, uh, let me just introduce the variables in here. So EI in here is the eccentricity of ellipse, and BI is the length of the uh, 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 minor axis of the ellipse. Yes? So, uh, real question. Uh, so you mentioned definite, uh, but uh, is the question uh, completely trivial just restrict to polynomial systems. Yeah. It's completely trivial. Uh, of course, you should know how to find the upper bound for the gamma. So, OK. This upper bound for gamma will be different if you have a polynomial system. Probably tighter than this one. So let's see. This bound of gamma. Can we go back to the definition of gamma again? Yes. OK, so is this guy so it's k derivative divided by the by the uh, first derivative mm -hmm. times k factorial and then you take the k okay right so and then let's go back to your oh. approximation so this is this mu is condition number right yes right which is basically like f prime prime over f prime, something like that? Uh, it is obtained by like a norm of f times norm of the f inverse or something like that. Yeah, and then right, and norm of f inverse, OK. Yeah, that's the condition number. And then what's the first term and the second term? What are the, why are the two terms? What's the m? So these terms covers the degree of the polynomials so if you think about the a capital F that I suggested before, we have a bunch of polynomial system in the top. So this part covers that part. So the ingredients part, which is analytic, system, analytic equations, they are going to be covered by this C. And the CI is... Uh, CI is will be obtained from this one, which is obtained by Cauchy integral. Cauchy integral. So it's interesting that you have one over R i, yeah, for the, but it's like one over R i square, right? Because they are R i twice. Yeah, so and why is that? Oh, the, these are obtained from the Cauchy integral, but uh, yeah, I mean the, mm -hmm. but I actually don't remember how exactly got this. Why we have, why we need to have two terms in here? But if you think about the derivative of this kind of, uh, so there are several ways to compute this kind of C i. So if you think about the derivative, oh, I see, I see. So let me just explain this way. Because this is obtained from the Taylor expansion. So it obtains from the uh, 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 each term in the Taylor expansion. And this obtained from the Cauchy integral. So if you, we can also find this CI using the derivative of the GI. In that case, we're going to increase this RI going to be square or something like that. So this ri squared is kind of essential, you're saying. You can't get rid of it. Can, uh, can you imagine getting only a single ri? Only single ri? Right. Rather than ri squared. Well, when the when we have some special 
Analytic system, maybe we can, but not in general. Okay. What is XI? XI is the coordinate for X. Ah. So each 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 coordinate we're gonna have a corresponding analytic system. So we wanna consider those as. Can you well. go back to original? I'm confused about what what you call ingredient. What ingredients is. Let's, let's see what's the ingredient there. Uh, okay, this okay. one. Here. Uh, so yeah. we have this function, these analytic functions will be called as ingredients. I see, I see. So we have two terms inside our bound. So first term covers this polynomial part, and second part to CI part two covers this analytic functions part. They are basically given by the definite functions. They're talking about definite. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's why they have this form. Yeah. And uh, how, so have you looked at any uh, industrial applications? Uh, and where the choice of definite comes from? So what uh, what is application? What, what concrete uh, systems do you have in mind that you will apply this to? Oh, so... And the error function, was it an artificial example just to demonstrate where it comes from some natural problem? Uh, we just consider it as just an example. An artificial, artificial example? Yeah, yeah. We, 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 example, example. Yeah, right. We couldn't actually... When we, when we work on this, I, I mean, even for now, we actually couldn't think about a concrete example in situation yet but but uh, maybe if you only work with like a trigonoma a trigonometric function or something like that then then probably we can work with like arts problem like a motion uh, arm machine with the motion arm problems so, like yeah something like we can also work with something like that so because trigonometric function is also definite so you can think about the motion arm problem using Robotics, you mean? Yeah, robotics, yeah. I think it's good actually to try to uh, get to some actual yeah, but examples from the. The reason world. that we didn't choose the robotic example was because it was done by. Oh, no. Uh, it was done by John and John Hamstein and Victor Lewandowski in this paper. So we actually compare with this result also. So sometimes. We can have the our bound can be better than this bound sometimes. So there's actually a result in the paper. But yeah, actually, we didn't use that concrete example as an our example inside the paper. You said that, uh, if we have the if we are able to do it for trigonometric functions, we can do it for robotics. Mm -hmm. but I mean, trigonometric function is way simpler than definite function. The definite function. So, what adi what additional thing do, do you have with definite functions? But what, uh, are you asking about what kinds of functions are there? I think maybe that? you are thinking in robotics, sines and cosines can be replaced. They are all really algebraic quantities. Yeah, but we also know how to evaluate. Because here, so at least for the for evaluating your perfect operator, you just need to have an interval extension of those functions. Mm -hmm. But we know how to do it for uh, we... trigonometric functions, we can do it. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. But uh, okay, so but let me just put in this case. So their work only works with alpha theory. So crouching method was first used in this work. Mm -hmm. So they I mean Crouching method, I mean, even though it was quite well known in the probably numerical analysis people, but it is the first time they're using well, this crouching method. In interval arithmetic. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. People, they don't know these things. Okay, I see. It, it's about interval community, of course. Yeah, so, I mean, in terms of like our algebraic geometry people, it was the first time they used this kind of interval method to certify the solution. Even for can the you, pre Can you say it again? Oh, so. Uh, in the applied algebraic geometry people, it was the first time that they're using this interval arithmetic to certify the roots, even for the polygon. Just to certify the roots, but some people use Kraft method to find the roots. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, of course, of course, of course. 
but yeah, but in, in terms of certification, it was the first time. Yeah, but if we know how to use it to find the roots, we know how to certify them. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but yeah, right, right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So, I need to skip. Okay, so let me just go back to our optimization problem. So now we have this EIBI because we have two ellipses in here. We have E1, B1, and E2, B2. So now we have this ob uh, objective function and we want to maximize them subject to this three constraints in here. So we have E of T in here, which is, the, which is given in here. So this is, a, which is called the complete elliptic integral of the second kind. So this is not even algebraic. So this is even though this is un 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 analytic, but not even algebraic. So this is kind of a quite complicated definite function. So, so it satisfies this kind of inequality, uh, this kind of differential equations. So anyway, with this using function, we want to solve this optimization problem. But in order to solve this one, we just consider the Lagrange multiplier. So we introduce three more variables, lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three in here. Now we have seven equations with the seven variables, so this is a secure system. Now we, we solve this system using some numerical solver, then we have this approximate root, then we we're gonna use a crouching method and alpha, 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 alpha theory to certify this root. So let me just start with alpha theory. So as you as I as we mentioned before, in our in alpha theory, we need to find that the upper bound for gamma, and we also have this gamma value, upper bound for this gamma value in here. And we need this capital R. So in this case, we use the radius convergence as a 0.005, I mean, which is less than radius convergence. Then in this case, alpha theory is less than 0.035, which is also less than this number. So alpha theory works for the certification. And crouching method. So in order to think about the crouching method, we just consider the give interval with the side lengths, which is 2 to the negative 10 to the 2, which contains this root. Even, of course, this is a seven-dimensional root, but because dimension is too narrow to contain that, I just only draw two dimension. Anyway, we consider this given input compact region capital I. Then if you compute inter uh, crouch operator, then you're going to be contained in here. So we can also certify, use, uh, we can also certify the root using the crouching method. Okay, so actually this length was 10 to the negative 13 or something like that, which is really smaller than this original input. What, what you're saying, crouching is better here? Is oh, no, no. This crouch operator is much smaller than this original input. I didn't mention about the, which one is better. So, okay, you, you certify using, let's say, alpha. alpha. Oh, yeah, this is alpha theory. Alpha theory, if you take uh, radius to be 0 0.05, mm -hmm. That's the radius of your box, right? Of the i, your region i. Oh no no no! This is the radius com radius convergence for the right. Okay. okay. Yeah yeah. Then and then how small do you have to be your box in order for this to apply? Oh, so it depends. Actually, when r okay, let me just yeah. When when r is too small, then this value will be bigger. So when r is too big, then this mi will be bigger. Right. So we need to choose really proper R. So did you use, so what did you choose in order to verify? Uh, you, you have a very concrete example, right? Yes. This optimization problem. Yeah. And you want to certify a particular route, uh, a particular solution, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if it's certified, then it really proves it is optimal. Is that right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Using this, you manage to certify that solution. If yeah, you yeah, to, yeah. What did you choose? That's what I'm trying to say. In order to apply this, you mean the this approximate version? Right. Approximation. Right. How did I choose this one? Or? Well, well, as you said, you have to choose R appropriately mm -hmm. so that it actually certifies it. You, you do have a box that you have a candidate solution, right? Mm -hmm. And now you have to certify it. So what number did you choose to, to certify? Okay, but this R is not related to the box which containing this. Oh, I understand. Yeah, yeah. But you have to choose something. Yeah, so right. How, how, how did I choose this one? I mean... Uh, 
but I don't care about this R because this is yeah, not yeah, R. Yeah, yeah. I have a particular root uh, that I'm trying to certify. Mm -hmm. Could you you could certify using this alpha method? Mm -hmm. What what how how do you choose your parameters so that you could actually certify? Right, you have to choose something. Uh, yeah, I, I have a box. I say I, this contains a solution certified using alpha method. So how did you do it? Yeah. Very concrete. This is a numerical example. I'm just asking how do you choose the numbers or what are the numbers that allows you to choose, certify? But you're asking about the region that we can... Yeah, yeah. whatever. But so if, if, if we have this kind of alpha value, of course, then we have a beta value or so. Then, from the alpha theory, yeah, yeah, that's we we have this kind of region. Yeah, but that's not actually. You don't need a region of input. Yeah, as we as we don't need a region the to. The size of the region you can certify. This is the meaning of it. Um, you you take the approximate solutions, and with this you get the um, radius of a region around this. Right. So did you certify? Do you succeed to certify using alpha theory? Yes. And what was the number you picked that you I mean, you have to have an approximate solution. Right. And how 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 approximate do you have to that this is your Yeah, approximate solution that we used. Okay, so you have you are mainly interested in the E1, E2, B1, B2, right? But the Lagrange multipliers are just yeah, helping yeah, just, you yeah. exist such yeah, numbers right. such that. So this is enough to set. You can certify this exam, this case. Yeah. Okay. And that's how that's like six digits or something. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. And is, the, is that any good? Is that I have no no idea. Is that six digits is good? Oh, so. Yeah, I mean, in this example, the seven digit was the kind of the minimal that uh, like a precision that we can have. So if you have a six digits, alpha theory starts to be failed. So that's the reason that we use the seven digits in here. Okay. But in interval arithmetic, we can have ten to the negative two, which is the box contains. This is a side so length. This is much box. better. Uh, in terms of like a precision, we can allow to have more crude input. We can yeah, have so it's a better certification method. Uh, but we so I will gonna compare these two methods later. But it is hard to say that because alpha theory usually certifies more, because alpha is, alpha theory certifies that it quadrat convergence. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. But you, certification is. A yeah, I mean, in terms of precision, yeah, it is better. I don't care. If you are yeah, right. Yeah, that's a separate problem. So right, for, right. For certification, I want it as big as possible. Right, if right. If you can certify with a mile of radius. That's right. even better. That's right. true. Yeah, that's true. So that's in terms how we should evaluate. Right. The, in terms of that cross method, is better. That's my point. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, just just like the question before. So probably it's gonna be natural to think about the comparison between two methods. So we also consider this kind of uh, capital F system equations, and we also have this approximation root, and we're gonna use both method in here again. But we're going to round this approximation on the several decimal places. And we're going to observe which method start to be paired first. So here's the results. The crotch method even succeed with the approximation rounded at the decimal place 1. How did you get that approximation? Oh, this is obtained from some numerical solver. Probably you just use Mathematica. So OK, so crotch method succeed even with the decimal places 1. But in order to succeed with alpha theory, we need more precision. But and this is because, just like I mentioned, because interval arithmetic usually allowed to have more crude input, and also alpha theory give us more information about the quadratic convergence also. Decimal places of what? Decimal places, which means that decimal places one means that we rounded this solution. Oh, just take 0.4, 0.5. Yeah. That's yeah. one decimal yeah. place. Okay. So this is all about regular solution. So now we will think about the multiple roots. 
So in order to think about the multiple roots, we need to think about what is the different what is the difference between the multiple roots and the regular roots when we do with the when we solve solve that using a numerical sol numerical solver, and we need to understand what is the challenging part in here. So let me just give a two example in here. Capital F of x is equal to x squared. We also have x is equal to zero with the multiplicity two. But I will solve this using some uh, numerical solver. I use Macaulay two. Then we are going to get these two solutions. But we should observe that this is actually has a two solution, which is not one solution, which means that we got a cluster of two roots. So let me just describe this using a diagram. So we have a capital F, which has a solution at the origin. But when we solve this system using numerical server, now we got a two points in here, which is close to each other. But we can understand this blue two points as solution of this capital G. So what is happening when we use the numerical solver in order to deal with the multiple roots is, even though we have capital F, but we have a two solution which is close, which is the which is the capital G, and this capital G is really close to capital F. This is what is happening when we deal with the multiple roots. So let me just deal with a little bit more complicated example, a little bit more tricky example. Let's say that we have a linear term x minus zero point one. And of course, we have a multiplicity one in here. If you solve this using a numerical solver, then we're going to get this kind of numerical root. And let's say that we switch this into A. And let's suppose that A is really small, like 0 0.00001, something like that. In that case, we're going to have this A in here and these two points in here. But if we draw this into the diagram, probably we can understand this. We're going to have these three points in here. But probably we can understand these three points as just a cluster of the three roots which are approximating the multiplicity three roots. Or we can also understand this as a, just a one regular root and the cluster of the two roots which are approximating multiplicity two roots. Which means that if you solve system using a numerical solver, we don't know what is the multiplicity. It can be understood as two or it can be understood as three. So that's the reason that we need to think about the concept of separation bound because we want to isolate our multiple roots and other roots, I mean, we want to guarantee that other roots are actually outside of the separation bound. Yes. I'm sorry, this is a question about uh, the previous part. Mm -hmm. Can I see mm -hmm. that? Yeah, 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 yes. So with the um, alpha certification, yes. Uh, do you also, you, here you're working only, only in the real domain, but with alpha certification, uh, you certify that the root is oh, real. I mean, yeah, we can, I mean, even for the crushing method, we can also work with the, over the complex. Yeah, for the, but, no, my, my question is, you have a real root, or a real, uh, an approximation of a real root, uh -huh, real. Uh -huh, uh -huh. No, sorry, you have, the approximation you have is real. Uh -huh. and when you certify it with alpha certification, uh -huh. does it certify that the actual root is also real or not? Oh, uh, I mean, this alpha theory itself cannot do that, but we can apply that alpha theory to check the realness of the root. We can do okay. that. Yes, we can okay. do that. But not in this way. Not, okay. not exactly in this way. Thank you. Now, I, let me step back one step. And, and just ask a general question. You know, the difference in real and complex, generally speaking, is very tough. You, you need very different techniques, especially in multivariate system. And yet, using these integral methods, like, I mean, Newton type methods, Crouching is just a Newton type yes, method, yes. allows you to easily switch between real and complex, and, and almost no consequence. It's very surprising in some sense, right? Why is that? I'm just just a general question. <laughs> because if you look at the, the the algebraic theory and everything for, for certifying roots and detecting, it's a completely different theory, right? I mean, for a real case, you have the Descartes rule of signs, Sturm's sequence theory. That's only the real case. I would say that's because Newton sees the complex just as R two. No, that's your that's what you think. That's my explanation. Yeah, that could be the reason. I'm not quite sure, but this methods for counting roots. Well, this is certified roots for counting roots. There's no way in the 
two methods are completely different. It's the way you can. Yeah, so, so it's curious. Then. Okay, share. So, actually, I don't like the way you pose this problem. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 like a red herring because you give a single point and say, is this a multiple root or a simple root? And then you say, okay, well, if you look at this, it looks like one root. And because you really cannot look at single number and say well, what you're trying to solidify, you have to also give a radius. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That then. Can distinguish the two. So oh, I see. <laughs> try to give a fairer way of building up the question. I see. Okay. Anyway, let's go on. So uh, now we want to uh, construct a separation bound which are isolated in multiple roots. So before we construct this separation bound, actually, probably can it is what's helpful to think about the, some desired property that we want to have inside our separation bound. So now we have a capital F, which is the polynomial system. Now we will just go back to our polynomial, go back to polynomial system for a while. And again, X star is just the exact root of the capital F, which is multiple root. Let's say that we have multiplicity N. Then the first property is, of course, step isolating other roots. So if there is other roots, which is called, denoted as Y, then of course this Y should be outside of the separation bound. So if you see this picture, this y, which is all the root, should be outside of the separation bound. This is the first property. Second property is quite similar to the first property. So let's say that this y is now a point inside our separation bound, which is close to x star. Then in that case, we want to say that capital F of y and norm of that is greater than or equal to some non-negative number, which actually, this is similar to first one, but which also gives us an approximation of the lower bound for the capital F of y. Okay, so this is quite help, useful property. And the third property is, let's say the capital G is the scarce system, but let's say the G is close to the capital F. Then in that case, inside our separation bound, then we want to have exactly multiplicity many roots inside our separation bound. Does M depend on Y? M. Uh, this big one? M, big M. Depends on Y? Yes, yes, it depends on Y. Yeah. It depends on the distance between X and Y. So these are the three proper, these are the properties that we want to get for the separation bounds. Okay. So, so let's look at this kind of previous works about the separation bounds. So did you and should in 2001 they uh, were studied about the separation bound for the multiplicity two roots, and uh, Lee Hong and several of their students worked about the separation bound for the multiple roots with the dimension of the cone of the Jacobian is equal to one case. So you're going to be really good if we can just deal with this kind of separation bound for all kinds of multiple roots. But the uh, multiple structure is really complicated. So we want to restrict ourselves to the, some kind of simpler cases. So we want to define simple multiple root. So in order to define, before you define that, let me just introduce the deflation method first. Can you go back to the yes. previous slide? Yes. So dimension of the kernel of f prime is one. Is that so? How strong a restriction is that? It covers the the, the do shoot case, right? Yeah, it covers the do shoot case and in general, and, what does it cover? And we can also have when we have a this uh, dimension of the cone of Jacobian is equal to one, we can have a multiplicity like two, three, or four, or five. You can right. have arbitrary many. But, but there are some restraints, right? The dimension is stronger than this. Just trying to understand what, what that. To, uh, can you give a concrete example just to help understand what dimension kernel of. Like, yeah, like if you have. Oh, so, so ah, I see. F, the Jacobian, which is F prime, mm -hmm. has co dimension one. That's what Yeah, right, ah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's. I see. Okay. So, I will, in order to define the simple multiple roots, I will talk about the deflation method. It is just like recovering the quadratic convergence of Newton's method for isolated multiple roots. So, if you have a multiple roots, it is usually uh, uh, so when we have a neutral iteration, we need to have an inverse of the Jacobian. 
But when we have a multiple roots, Jacobian is no more inverse, invariable. So we cannot define a Newton's method. But deflation method makes us to have a quarter of the convergence of the isolated multiple roots. How can we do that? We, we introduce more variables and more equations. And then we construct a more aug augmented system, which is larger size than the original one. Then you're going to have isolated roots, which is probably less multiplicity than the original roots. So this is the one. But let me just introduce a little bit more uh, with detail. We use the algorithm of Anton Lakin and Jan Rochel, the Island Zhao, which was suggested in 2006. So we have capital F, which is a square polynomial system. We have isolated multiple roots x star. Now we have a dimension of the cone of the Jacobian is equal to kappa. So from now on, kappa is the notation for the dimension, co-dimension of the Jacobian. Okay. So we need to have some random choices. So B is the generic matrix with this size, and B is also a randomly chosen vector. And then we can construct this kind of augmented system, which is denoted as capital H. Then there is a unique vector lambda with this size. And we can construct this kind of solution, which is isolated 0 for this h. And probably multiplicity of, multiplicity of this x star lambda is less than the x star, than the x star of the capital F. So if it still remains singular, then we're going to iterate this uh, deflation process multiple times in order to, uh, uh, until we get a regular solution. And it is also known that if you multiply uh, uh, multiple times, then we're gonna eventually we're gonna get a regular solution. So say that again. So, okay. So, uh, can you give a co more concrete example about deflation method? Yeah, yeah. What what, what you're doing? So, okay. Uh, how can I say? It? Like. So when we have a, some kind of multiple roots, we introduce more lines or something like that in order to decrease the degree of uh, decrease the multiplicity of the roots in there. So this is such, such a technique. So decrease the decrease the multiplicity. The root. introducing lines. Introducing more variables and more equations on the. So. We are in, in geometric description, we are thinking about ideal which is generated by this more equations and more variable. Then you're gonna be some kind of tangent bundle, then stratified tangent bundle, which has prob hopefully probably have a lower multiplicity than the original solution. So you keep the f unchanged, right? Yeah, we don't change the f, but we introduce this more system, which is which has some random choices in here. And could you explain random choices? Uh, we just choose some matrix with this size just randomly. So what's the final number of variables you actually introduce? Kappa. Uh, uh, this this many this many variables. N minus kappa. Yeah. So at most you double the number of variables. Yeah, so we're going to increase the size of the system. But at most by two. Yeah. So the problem is when we apply this deflation method many times, then we need to deal with the larger and larger system, the original one, so which is computationally expensive. Right. So we're going to come back to this point when I suggest some open problems. But this is a deflation method. Now we can define simple multiple root. Could you, could you go back? Yes. So could you explain precisely uh, again generic? Oh, generic means that like we want to have. Uh, it's a theorem, right? Ye theorem. Yeah, right. Okay. So could you say precisely? Oh, I, I see. So we we're gonna with the when we chose this uh, matrix and vector randomly, then with probability one we we're gonna get the regular roots. Uh, but randomly, no. So what's the meaning of random? So we just want to choose a matrix outside of some uh, as a major zero set, outside of the major zero set, some kind of the co-dimension uh, bigger than one, one set of the co-dimension bigger than one. Okay. Yeah. So 
some kind of if you have a plane then we want to avoid some line special line but you don't know in advance which one right? yeah of course so of course it is possible to have a really bad example but with the probability one we can just when, when you just choose randomly then we can opt, uh, we can guarantee that this max will succeed in, with the probability one So now we can define simple multiple roots. So I, when we have isolated multiple roots, it will gonna be called as a simple if and only if this deflation process terminates by only one iteration. So in terms of deflation method, this is the simplest case. Okay. So we have really nice characterization for this simple multiple root. So let's say that we have a X star, which is a multiple root, and we have a kappa in here. Then X star is simple if and only if just like we have a random choice for the vector and the matrix before, so we also have a random choice for the orthogonal you mean basis. Simple means isolated, right? Yeah, like isolated. Simple, simple usually means multiplicity one. Right. So, so isolated means you have a single root but high multiplicity. Right. Uh, oh no, but simple multiple root is this, this is a term that we just made. So right. So. When you say simple here, you mean what? So it sounds like a contradiction. Simple multiple. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. So that's yeah. Why why didn't you say simple root means right. so, single root multiplicity one? And isolated root means the single root, but it may have high multiplicity. Right. We coded this as a simple multiple root because among the multiple roots, this is the simplest case in terms of deflation method. Because Oh, so it's just a title. It yeah, just a title. It is oh, just a, oh, it's a terminology. And it's related define. to your deflation process. Yeah, in terms of deflation process, it, because you're going to terminate by only one iteration. And is it is your deflation process really so sort of ge geometrically meaningful that you know? Yeah, it is. Uh, it really geometric. What's the geometric meaning of deflation? Two iterations, for instance. Oh, uh, two iterations. Some okay. Sometimes, so when we think about the like uh, points inside the points inside the tangent bundle, probably you are gonna get the still gonna get the multiple roots. So if if you apply the one deflation process, then if your multiplicity does not drop, then we should apply that once more. If you draw, if you multiply that enough time, then it will gonna be eventually it will gonna be the regular root. It will it will gonna be the simple root. Uh, but when does happen? Actually, I don't know. It really deals with the really complicated multiplicity structure. Right. It really depends. Right. right. In, in algebraic geometry, right, I mean, curves and so on, that there's this idea of blow up, right? Yeah. Uh, and you use this blow up, then, then something happens, and then you keep blowing up until, and this forms a tree structure. Right? Yeah. Is this related to blow up? Uh, I I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, I. So, now we gotta choose some orthonormal basis. Then we can construct this curly A operator. Then when we have a simple multiple roots, this curly A should be invertible with the probability one. So the reason that we, I say mention of the probability one is we need to choose some random orthonormal basis for the kernel. So let me just explain about this curly A a little bit more, a little bit more clearly. So we have two terms in here. So first term is the Jacobian, so which is a matrix. We have a second order derivative, which is the three tensor, but we multiply with the orthonormal basis, so it becomes a matrix. So this is just a linear operator, but it becomes uh, invertible when we have a simple multiple root. So let me just give an, oh, so this definition, now we can extend our definition onto the analytic system, because if you think about the Taylor expansion of the equations inside our system, then locally, we're going to have the same multiple structure. So we can also define this kind of simple multiple roots onto the analytic system also. So let me show you an example. We have a three by three system equations in here. We have sine function, which is analytic function. We have a simple multiple zero at the origin. Kappa is equal to three. Multiplicity is 11. Now we choose three vectors in here. Then we can construct this curly A in here, which is invariable. So this uh, theorem is really nice because if you remind the gamma parameter in the alpha theory, we have inverse of Jacobian, but multiple roots, this Jacobian is no more invariable. 
now we can define this gamma kappa using this a in here because this is invariable. Okay. So this gamma kappa is always well defined when the x is a simple multiple root of the capital F. So also let me just introduce one more parameter which is called small d in here, which is the smallest positive root of this equation in here. So this equation always have positive real root. So we will just choose the smallest one. So this is just the parameter. Now we can construct our separation bound. Let's say that we have x star, which is a simple multiple root of capital F. Then let's say that y is just another root. Then the distance between y and x star is at least this number. So we have O centered at x star, which is this many radius, and the y should be outside of this one. So this is the first property of the separation bound. Second property is we want to approximate the lower bound of this capital F of y, which means that we have the same setting, but let's say that this y is now a point which is satisfying this one, so which means that they are close enough. In that case, the norm of the capital F of y is greater than or equal to this number, so we can approximate the value of this capital F of y. Okay. So this is the evaluation bound. Yeah, right. For the values inside this, some bound. That's it. Least D times. Of course, it depends on why. Okay. So now we need to think about the third property of the separation bound. So in order to talk about that, we need to think about the concept of the distance between two systems. So we can just define the distance of the two system around this point locally like this, then using this kind of distance, we can have third property of the separation bound, which means that we have simple root with the, now we have a multiplicity m in here. In this case, in this case, when, when we have a positive number, positive number, capital R, which is satisfying this one, then if you think two system, which is really close enough, something like this, then there are this exactly multiplicity many roots of this capital G inside the separation bound. So, uh, so this R is whenever X and Y are less than R apart. Things going on. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so if you if you remind the situation of the capital G, so when you solve the system equation using numerical solver, then you're gonna get a solution of capital G, which is close to capital F. So this is describing that situation. Right. So when we have a separation bound, numerical roots will be also contained inside that. Okay. So but because we have multiplicity in here, but of course when we solve the system numerically, we don't know what is the multiplicity of the multiple roots. So we want to have at least some small information about this multiplicity. So when we have kappa, which is a codimension of Jacobian, then this multiplicity is at least two to the, two to the kappa. So this gave us a, multi, uh, a lower bound of the multiplicity. I think that this is a quite well-known fact in the community of algebra community, but I, we couldn't find any reference for this one, so we just put it. Now we want to certify our solution using this kind of separation bound. Now we have a, some analytic system. This is x is just a point, so probably the numerical root that we want to certify. Now we will just choose some orthogonal vectors. We don't need to follow these details in here, but what I want to do is we just want to make a system capital G which is close to capital F. Then we can have some linear operator, which is a minus h, which is invariable. Now we can define the gamma kappa with the three inputs, capital F, x, and v. Using this one, we can define, we can have this following theorem. So we can compute these values in here. So if this inequality is true, then capital F will have at least two to the kappa roots inside the ball center that x with this radius. 
So we have two to the couple roots because we know that multiplicity is at least two to the couple. Of course, we don't know what is the exact multiplicity, but we know that at least two to the couple multi uh, roots should be inside this ball, inside the ball center of the X. So I want to show you how to use this in terms of real uh, certification problem. So let's say that we have capital F, which is given in here. It actually has exact root at the origin with kappa is equal to three, multiplicity eight, but we don't know. But we just solved this using some numerical solver. Probably we we're gonna get a bunch of numerical solution, especially around the origin, then we we're gonna get eight solutions, which is close to each other. We're gonna call some of them, one of them as T. Then we can just compute this inequality, then we can check that this is true. It means that we have a ball centered the T with this radius, which contains eight roots of the multiplicity of this capital F. So if I just draw the diagram in here, now we have a root, uh, the, well, now we have a ball centered the T, which contains eight roots of this capital F. But we know that distance between origin and this T is of course less than this radius. This X star should be contained inside the original, original separation bound. So how can we complete this certification? We were gonna do this for other eight roots in here. So if you think about this ball center the T2, second multiple roots, then we we were gonna contain also X star. T3 also contains X star. Just like this, if we do the eighth root, do the eighth root in here, then we're gonna contain X star in here. Now we can complete this certification. So I want to suggest uh, open problems before I finish the talk. So if you think about the regular roots case of the analytic function, we just certify the roots using some oracles. So next question is, can we find such oracles for these kind of analytic functions? For example, like holonomic function, as I mentioned before, holonomic function is a multivariate setting, multivariate version of the definite function. So this is a linear PDE of the polynomial coefficients. So we, it is also already known that uh, how uh, the, the major series also exists for this kind of holonomic function. And also, so, but we don't know how to evaluate the various holonomy functions. So one hope is there's, a, we can also think about D module theory because this is, this kind of holonomy functions really closely related to this D module theory. Also, there is uh, one known way to evaluate this holonomy function, which is called holonomy gradient descent, which is course works nicely, but the problem is this holonomy gradient descent is not certified. So, there's no certified way to uh, evaluate these holonomic functions yet. So, and we can even more be ambitious on working on the Fafian functions. So it is really a little bit tricky to define what is Fafian functions in here, but it is some kind of a function obtained from the chain related to the differential equations. So if we can deal with holonomic functions, probably we can also deal with this kind of Fafian functions. What about, what, what about the multiple, what about the open questions in the multiple roots? So maybe we can think about the Newton iteration for the multiple roots. So if you think about the deflation method that I suggested, that I mentioned before, in order to apply deflation method, we need to think about the augmented system, which means that we need to have a larger system than the original one. Which means that if you multiply, if you apply, if you apply the deflation process multiple times, then it will gonna be really computationally expensive. So if you if we can define into an iteration on the, this multiple roots, probably it is you're going to be computationally really much better because we can just use our smaller original system. So I want to suggest this algorithm. Of course, we don't need to read this one, but in the second part, we just use curly A, the T operator with, that I suggested before. So instead of the, this Newton iteration, we can just use this uh, curly A operator instead of that, then we can define some kind of modified Newton's algorithm. And I just call this as a prototype theorem because we are still working on this one, but we can show that this, with this using algorithm, the, with this algorithm actually, we can get the quarter the convergence of this revised Newton's method. Okay. Let me stop here, thank you. was way longer than I thought. You took two hours? No, uh, but 75 minutes. <laughs> yeah, a lot of great problems here. Um, yeah, so, um, it's 
some questions right now. So you yeah, 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 you can. yeah, 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 yeah. So. How do you so so if I give you a, a poly disk, how do you confirm that there are how do you count the number of roots in a poly disk? Oh that's yeah, that's the problem that I couldn't answer when we work on this problem. Because that's the reason that we just at least want to know the lower bound of the multiplicity. So we actually we don't know. Uh, um, but I guess somehow degree theory gives that information. It's just that I don't know of any way to effectively use degree theory. You, some kind of intersection theory? No, just uh, sort of, uh, you know, by integration, right? We know that basically you integrate around a region. Can count the number of roots in there. Well, in the complex area case. But degree theory, I think, generalizes this to, to all dimensions. And developing that as a tool to count, I think, is really absolutely critical for, for making progress in all these things. Yeah, yeah. Because I, you know, I, I said, I don't like your assumption that you say, oh, I, I, I know I have a root here, root here of multiplicity m. You actually never know that. Yeah, you right. That's, that, that. that's that's the point. That's the problem. So, I mean, basically, along our line of clustering, you have to begin with, you have to be able to count first. Mm. If you can't count, you can't really do serious computation because nobody's going to tell, yeah, you have exactly a single root of multiplicity 5. No, you don't know that. Counting is a meaningful problem regardless of multiplicity. I think we should try to think hard on this. So can I ask a question where, where yeah. I think to this? Can you show your, the last slide? So your A Kale yeah. uh, inverse of Kale, can you show again the definition? Yes. Maybe we should go back. Sure. Uh, okay, let me show you. Yeah, this one. So here, where does the multiplicity appear? It's K, kappa, right? Yeah, right. Uh, this is the dim uh, dimension of the co uh, co dimension of the Jacobian. So multiplicity does not work. So in the simple multiple roots, we can have arbitrarily high multiplicity. So multiplicity cannot be bounded. So it's the dimension of the subspace spanned by all the different shorts that vanish on X, right? Uh, what, which one? This one? This, uh, what, uh, what? So you say it's a co-dimension of the Jacobian? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a co-dimension of the Jacobian. So can you, provided that you manage to prove the last theorem you were showing us, can you imagine an iterative process like you? We, we proved the quadratic convergence. But so you you could um, find or guess the multiplicity by constructing different Calais. And since you don't have, uh, why you don't have the quadratic convergence, you change the Calais and at the point, you should be able to construct a K. Of this A, even yeah, though we don't know what is the what is the exact root? I was, I was trying to elaborate on what she said. And imagine a test to count the number, the multiplicity. Mm -hmm. Meaning you construct several, uh, oh. you, uh, like you do it. You construct different matrices K for different multiplicities, and for the correct multiplicities, you should um, have but, something that converges quadratically. Oh wait, but this curly A does not relate it to multiplicity. 
it only relates to the kappa. Kappa is the co-dimensional identical band. So, so it, it, yeah, it does not give you any information about the multiplicity. Okay, so, I mean, in order to answer the G's question, maybe we should think about something else, like, like just like the degree theory or, or some numerical techniques. Very nice. All right, thank you again. Thank you.